and oops, cancel. And let me turn the transcript on as well. Okay. Um, so I was just telling class that I had lunch with a really interesting fellow last week who is more conservative than all three of us. Uh, and we really, he's also very pragmatic CEO type and wants like efficiency or effectiveness to be the rule, not, you know, uh, and one of the things he said pretty early on uh, was, you know, if you go look at the number of cops shooting black men, it's actually really low compared to black on black shootings, which is a super high number. And I'm like, oh, head wants to explode. Um, but then we also, we, we went into nuclear power. We went into a, a bunch of other kinds of topics and, and climate change. Uh, he was also like, he thinks MAGA is horrible and just destroying the, the, the right. But one of his really good questions was, if the right is so horrible and so out of touch with the mainstream population, when you look at polls, why are the Democrats holding on to a razor thin majority in the, in the, the house uh, or the Senate? Like why, why are, why is there, why are they not overwhelmingly the party in power? What is, what is up with that? And he says, part of his diagnostic is the Democrats suck. The Democrats are really badly broken and he's interested in what ways they're broken and how to fix them and all that. So all these things came tumbling out and all in an hour and a half lunch uh, just north of uh, of the Columbia River. Uh, in fact, sort of overlooking the Columbia River it was pretty nice. There's a there's a part of Vancouver where they built up the waterfront nicely and there's a bunch of restaurants. Um, and so I've offered him to slow the conversation down. I'm just reading some of his replies this morning uh, and he's very happy to engage and explain his logic, which I need and want and like, like that that's really important for me in any of these discourses. I also realized that in our Thursday calls and within OGM, we're almost reflexively lefty most of the time. And we've kind of barfed out people who didn't sort of fit, fit our notions of how we were doing things uh, in a couple of different ways. And I'm really interested in, in in being able to have a conversation in that middle ground, because it turns out that like 30% of the country is firmly locked into MAGA Trump. Uh, Trump is the, the flawed messenger from God. Some 30% of the country is like firmly at the opposite end, although it isn't nearly as opposite, because I don't think that the far left is anything like the far right these days. But in the middle lies this great mass of people who are looking for something to do, say, follow, vote for, agree with, that works. And, and I think they'd like a better life for their kids. They, there's a whole bunch of like things that we all have in common. And our reflexes in how to respond don't take us in the right place. And I'll say one more thing, then I'll shut up for a second because I want to go back into our normal conversation. But um, uh, the U.S. responses to COVID were in many ways self-defeating in the sense that they weren't open research, open questions. Hey, we we acknowledge and realize that you may have reasons to not trust big pharma. So we're going to go out of our way <clears throat> to be open and do this. And, and, and it's like, nah, a lot of the stuff was, was kind of mandates or near mandates or actual mandates. And then a lot of stuff was behind the curtain that we didn't sort of get to see how the sausage was made. So who trusts it? Um, and I think one of our remedies is transparency. I don't think it's by far the only remedy. And I think transparency rapidly devolves into way too many things to answer and way too many questions asked and way too much data to look at and all of that. But maybe we can proxy it out to people we trust on different sub-issues who actually track those, those issues and understand the dynamics of each of those places. And then we can sort of have champions in each of these sub-questions kind of compete with, with each other. Um, I'm on a mailing list where Amory Lovins and Carl Page kind of went at it on nuclear energy. And Amory Lovins is a no nukes under any situation. It's not economically reasonable. It's not anything. <clears throat> and Carl Page is like, nukes have a lower accident rate than everything else. They are immediate, clean, renewable energy. Uh, and uh, as my new friend Scott from lunch said, um, renewable solar and wind, uh, there's a thing called the duck curve. Uh, in energy, which basically says that renewables are never where you want them when you want them. Uh, when when there's peak demand on the grid is when the sun goes down. Uh, and unless you have fabulous batteries, uh, if you don't eat energy when you make it, um, and I don't know what the lag factor is, but if you don't sort of use energy as you as you produce it, um, it, it goes away. 
and we don't have good batteries and all the answers for batteries out there more or less suck. Uh, and we're not going to store everything in lithium ion batteries or in everybody's Tesla. So like way too many really good questions. <clears throat> they come back to how we're writing what we're writing and what we're doing and the big questions we want to answer. I think they do a lot. Um, and I'd like to go back into sort of the origin and goals of ODM and treat some of this as discourse to slow down and map out and contrast and compare and to see if we can't sort out a couple of these things. Sorry, all of that was lurking in my head, apparently. Yeah, there is actually a major pivot in in the in the uh, conversations. Um, you know, I've, I have this slide deck where uh, uh, the introductory is there are basically two major levers you can pull. One is energy, one is photosynthesis. So I've been I've been doing I've been saying this for like six years now. I've had this in my slide deck, and photosynthesis is basically land use issues, right? I mean, in a part context, whether that's forestry or whatever. But then when you think that 80% of, of water globally is used for agriculture, and that brings out a natural prioritization, you know, we can focus on trees and which is super important, but, you know, 80% is used for, for agriculture and trees are being cut down for agriculture. So when you, so then comes this this what what is now I, I, I listened yesterday to uh, a very esoteric uh, uh, discussion on on uh, uh, by physicists very high level I mean I had a really hard time uh, following it but they were <clears throat> debating the role of water and how little we know about how water really impacts the global climate oh interesting and uh uh and 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 it's now contradicting established climate science in ways that was not anticipated and it's based on actual observation you know they're now saying that our models uh, cannot uh, uh fully explain this but we see in observations where this thing is going right and when so you're sure, do you have a link to the video still no, I, I would have to dig it up. It would, I'm just streaming through stuff. Oh, and this was just one of those things. Um, but when you when you think about the intrusion of fresh water into the ocean streams, for example, is actually causing the meridian uh, 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 distribution to collapse, right? Because fresh water sits on top of salt water. Uh, it prevents the 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 normal. Um, curve to go for for water to to uh, get into colder zones to absorb more cold salt water can absorb more cold before it freezes um and and so now i mean don't hold me to to trying to explain this but there are basically two factors you now mm -hmm. that impact the the gulf stream the, uh, the function one is the uh, arctic ice cover which uh, uh, energizes the water. And the other one is the content of fresh water to salt water. And so what, co what everyone completely underestimated was the impact of trillions of gallons of water melting from glaciers all over the globe, fresh water, right? And that is now, it is already causing a measurable slowdown you know, of, of, the, of the Gulf Stream. And there are, there are, I mean, I've seen one report that's saying this could collapse by 2025. Because I send up there, there is one video that I sent actually to OGM and everywhere, um, this science guy, really explaining in great detail how this all works. And he's saying there is a gradual decline in speed, you know, in velocity of this stream. But there comes a point where this should, could actually just boom, drop, right? And the consequences would be absolutely catastrophic, you know, global global climate impact. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, which I sort of serendipitously discovered, to my surprise, scientists not really looking at this, we have literally tried out millions of square miles of farmland, you know, with the application of chemicals, because when you put uh, uh, synthetic nitrogen and pesticides, uh, into the soil, it kills the soil microbiome. The soil microbiome, when it when it uh, uh, gets damaged, releases carbon. 
So 25% of the carbon in the atmosphere is actually attributed to so to uh, to uh, come from soil, you know, soil releasing its carbon. 25% of what's up there. So that's one thing. But the, the more important thing is when soil dries out, it disrupts the hydrologic cycle because about 60% of local rain actually comes from the um, uh, the, the, the interchange you know, between local evapotranswaporation, it's called, right? So it, it, uh, you have the local evaporation from soil that goes up and then comes back down and that happens multiple times. When the soil is dry, then, then you're creating an accelerating effect of that. And that's when you have prolonged periods of droughts and then you have storm systems coming in and you have soil that is compacted and can't hold, it can't even absorb the water, it just runs off and takes topsoil with it. And that's exactly what we are observing you know, on a global level, everywhere where industrial agriculture has been practiced on a wide scale. So there, there's actually at this, at this immediacy, it's more important to focus on water and the restoration of water tables and water sheds you know, than it is on energy because energy, there's only so much you can do and it's not going to solve the problem. You know, we could be energy neutral tomorrow and continue farming the way we do, and it would push us way beyond any boundary uh, we could, we could any threshold we could handle. So that's why this focus on agriculture and food systems is really gaining traction now. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but it is it is as disruptive in the food system as it is in the energy sector. Uh, so now, now, I mean. Think about all the mechanics and garages and gas stations, you know, that have uh, serviced combustion engines for you know, more than a century, and then all of a sudden this wants to go away. And now in food, it's the same thing. I mean, all in, these in, in nineteen in nineteen ten, all those people were blacksmiths and uh, horse couriers, and you know, et cetera. Like like like, there was a period around nineteen ten where that flipped before. Right. Uh, and all of a sudden, these new careers just opened up. And now we're going to go through another period like that. And we, we're not doing anything to make it better. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. go ahead, sir. Yeah. And, and so, um, and, and I, sorry for, I had a little disruption, but I was listening to everything that was being said. And this is like going from the macrocosm that Jerry was talking about to the mi microcosm that Klaus was talking about in terms of um, details, okay? And um, what's not happening, unfortunately, is, is real conversation to try to come up with wise solutions. And it's all devolved into the politics of right, wrong, right, left, win, lose, fault, blame, commercial versus uh, non-commercial and the real discussions never seem to happen i mean the us congress i think is that or or, or they they don't happen at the level that that needs to happen today so that we can have an informed you know electorate um and so that people can get real evidence you know and 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 the idea of 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 how people get pigeonholed, um, <laughs> you know, it's shameful. It, at some level, it really is shameful. And at some level, it, it really is, you know, how stupid are we? We're supposed to be intelligent beings, and yet we're acting like absolute idiots. We have we have an epidemic of stupidity. It's just, it's just all around we've got all this knowledge and all this wisdom and um and in some ways no pun intended it's being trumped by power and money which is the story of humanity in one sense yeah and it, but the, the 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 critical piece i think at this moment in time is that the consequences could be so dire Okay, you know, the consequences could be so dire 
in terms of wiping out the species in some in some sense. And and on both sides, both sides are screaming about existential risk. <clears throat> on the far left, it's what you just said. It's it's basically uh, we could wipe out the planet. And on the far right, it's we are our cultures are being wiped out. We are we are in existential risk as a people as a civilization. That's happening. Um, thanks, Klaus. Thanks, the link. Yeah, okay. there's an article that that uh, sort of focuses on on you know, we need to talk about water and in, in, uh, in the context of climate change. Um, so that that uh, that resonated uh, uh, really well. Um, but the 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 uh, the challenge. So so my partner contacted Nestle, you know, saying uh, can we you know, uh, uh, you know do some work for you. And they came back basically saying, you know, what could, could you possibly uh, uh, want to do? So I sent them uh, the, uh, the extracts from my videos, basically saying the challenges farmers are facing to shift into regenerative practices and its impact on, on uh, food systems. Uh, and so the for the industry, um, you take Nestle, Cargill. I mean, you know, there, there, is, there is just only a handful of companies, really. Um, they have totally locked in on the centralized uh, uh, supply chain, monocropping practices that uh, only work if you deal with genetically designed seeds that can withstand the application of heavy doses of herbicides and insecticides. Um, and and uh, fed with synthetic nitrogen made with natural gas. It's an insanity you know, to base a global food system on that because all of the ingredients they have to use, like phosphates and so on, are finite. You know, fossil fuel, so, there is, so how long you know, can this possibly go on? But for them to change now means that they would have to decentralize their supply chain and it, it breaks down the entire... The entire uh, system. I mean, it's really as invasive uh, as as is the energy transition. You know, getting out of the combustion engine for the uh, for the uh, energy sector, um, and but but it it resonates at a much deeper level with people. You know, the the uh, because food is more is, is a lot more understandable and closer, and connecting food with chemical contamination and disease you know, and nutrient deficiency uh, and watershed uh, damage and all of that uh, is much easier to, to, to convey to a broader audience. And you don't have to talk about climate change in that context. Yeah. My, um, just, just as, as an aside, and I think this could be a little bit of an example of what I was just um, speaking to. Um, our cousin visited um, on Friday and um, his son, who is in his early 30s, is a brilliant computer scientist. And he just went to work for a startup. And this is just, you know, mind blowing. One, what the startup was doing in terms of application in the, in the agricultural center, Klaus, they invented some kind of a machine um, technology combined with farming equipment that would actually be able to detect which individual plant <laughs> was being invaded by uh, a species and needed some kind of a pesticide. And it would only put pesticide on that individual plant in, a, in an, entire, an entire field. So yeah. it was kind of like a combination tractor, pesticide dispenser, and 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 computer technology going yeah. through the furrows in the field. You've heard of this. Okay? Oh yeah, there is another there is another technology in development that uses lasers, and it's just sap you know, <laughs> uh, with a laser. I mean, but I mean, let's face it. Um, how is this going to feed you know eight billion people? I I, I mean, uh, you know the the sheer volume of of product we're talking about when you have square miles of fields, you know. Uh, this, these are these are, um, I mean, techno techno dreams. You now that uh, it's much easier to get rid of weeds by putting a cover crop on it, you know, and rotating your crop that that prevents 
weeds from forming in the first place. Because these what had these monocrops, they're putting the same crop into the ground over and over, meaning that pests you now uh, uh, attack those to, and, and become better at attacking these crops, yeah. which means they have to up the lethal dose and yeah. you know and, and uh, and this is where this is where the commercial enterprise and making money kind of trumps what the wise thing to do would be at a at a at, at more of a, a you know a global level and, right. and and how can we how can we regulate promote um this mm -hmm. I, I think it comes down to communication so i i advanced uh the the uh a neo book a little bit here if I can share the screen for a moment. So so here's where we left off the last side. Um this is this is from coming back, sorry. This is so the spiral of human organizational development, this second you know, chapter here. And so we had engaging minds, changing menus, reforming our relationship with food. So going through the crisis of the industrial food system, food is a cultural element. And then engaging the general public a spiral dynamics approach. Um, and then, uh, so then we you know, the crisis of the industrial food system. Um, you know, the, the, in conclusion here, then food as a cultural element, we put in a summary on that. Um, then, did I, yeah. So bottom up responses, mixed approaches, and then conclusion. And then I, brought this down to the next level. And it, it says about communicating insights in a course of actions throughout the spiral. Now, I thought that the information was probably consolidated enough to get to that. And <clears throat> what I what I asked ChatGPT to do here is use, um, use the letter to a Hindu from Tolstoy, you know, as a baseline to uh to gauge human uh the the uh uh the, the natural tendencies of our species yeah so what is saying then the interplay of morality and selfishness because we live in this tension right we have the evolutionary perception understanding of morality but then we're also selfish and those two things are always in interplay and when one becomes uh, uh when when Selfishness becomes too strong, then morality is being violated. And, and uh, when morality takes precedence, it may violate our selfish interests. Um, so it, it says, the, so it, you know, the chat GBD is saying our species, it's particularly interesting when applied to the current food crisis. Individuals must strive to live according to moral laws and that collective change can only happen when individual hearts change first. Now he also hints, I mean, and he's referring to Tolstoy here, I should say, it's, uh, it also hints at our natural inclinations towards self-centeredness, which are often at odds with this spiritual idea. Given these parameters, our evolutionary selfish traits as a species and the innate moral principles that also dwell within us, let's examine a course of action most likely to succeed in the United States. Um, so you would have community engagement and education, which is bottom up, um, appeals to the selfish nation and so on. Then you have federal and state regulations coming top down. And then you have economic incentives, which is top down and bottom up. Um, then you have public and private partnerships, collaboration between government bodies and corporate stakeholders. Uh, this alliance serves the self-interest of corporations and also fulfills a moral obligation to protect natural resources. And that obviously balance is completely out of whack here. And then social and moral appeal. Launching a campaign <clears throat> that appeals to the ethical and spiritual sensibilities of the population, tying in religious, moral, and patriotic themes. This addresses the evolutionary principles of morality, urging individuals to look beyond their selfish interests for the greater good, aligning with the ideas espoused in all major religions and philosophies. 
And then the conclusion would be balancing centralized governance and community-driven efforts is key. You know, the way to navigate the waters between selfish and moral inclinations inherent in the nature of our species is to appeal to both. Present solutions in a way that they seem to benefit the individual or local community first and foremost, but frame these benefits within a larger ethical narrative. This could be our best shot at implementing a sustainable transformation. It even talks like I do, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this could be our best shot at implementing yeah. a sustainable transformation of our food systems in the United States, mm -hmm. a tactic that recognizes our complex human nature, both its flaws and its profound capabilities for good. So chat GPT 4.0 confidence rating, I would give it an 80% confidence level to this approach, understanding the societal dynamics are complex and ever-changing, but I believe it's an effective path that incorporates Tolstoyan principles with modern challenges. And also with a kind of a skeptical slash negative view of human nature as being selfish. It's, it's sort of, that's one of the working assumptions of that generated scenario. Yes. Yeah. So um, the question that, are, that arises in my mind, and I think you've, you've articulated, either you or ChatGPT has yeah. articulated this in a lovely way, Klaus. Um, <laughs> and I agree. I, I, I asked I, a lot of questions. You know, that was... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but the, the, the output depends upon the questions, okay? Um, you know, Gigo, the principle here. Um, Garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good stuff out. Um, so yes, and what's the practical path to actually get something like, like the wisdom result implemented? So I asked that question too. Um... And it goes here, so engaging the general public. And so now we're going into spiral dynamics. And so understand, so it goes beige. You know, the beige is the, like uh, the, uh, those focused on immediate survival and basic needs. Those are uh, indigenous people, uh, uh, completely uneducated people. I mean, it's just like uh, the, the base of society. Um, and so it's emphasized how sustainable Farming ensures the long-term availability of essential food supplies, can provide immediate affordable access to nutritious food. Then you go into purple, tribalistic. Those are really small parts of ours, of the U.S. society. You know, they're, they're very marginal. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are with strong community bonds and traditions. Highlight how traditional farming methods align with community values and ancestral wisdom. Then is red. Red would be the Trump era, the MAGA world. So those seeking power, individualism, and status showcase, showcase how choosing sustainable organic foods is a status symbol of being informed and responsible. Then blue, this is the Penn, Michael, Mike Pence uh, uh, crowd. Uh, those driven by order, law, and moral codes. No, there were the religious right, um, not just the right, but I mean religious people in general align sustainable food practices with religious or ethical principles. Then you have orange, the achievists, motivated by success, innovation, material rewards, demonstrate how sustainable practices in food contribute to economic growth, personal health. Then you have green, which is the Sierra Club, now communitarian. And then you have yellow integrative, which where uh, OGM wants to be. Uh, those seeking to understand and integrate various systems, provide comprehensive information on how sustainable food choices impact all aspects of life and society. And then you have turquoise, aspirational, for most of us, you know, those seeking the interconnectedness of all life. So, so that's basically you now the, ne the next level to drill down on, because now you would have to, I would start with red, actually, I would ignore beige and purple because the political influence of those groups is marginal. The most impactful group politically is orange, actually. Uh, the loudest is red and blue. Um, but you know, so, so here could, one could structure, for example, red 
uh, a communication strategy directly aimed at MAGA voters, mm -hmm. you know, the MAGA crowd. So what what captures them? Um, and then this blue would be, you know, the the religious crowd. You know, so you're using, and each one of these colors really has its own language. You know, they're using uh, they're using unique metaphors uh, that that play within within uh, this segment um, and and vocabulary. So so that's that's how far I got it. I have found your new tagline. I put it in the chat. Make agriculture great again. <laughs> you know, if it could actually work, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a terrible idea. Call it the new MAGA. You might want to go buy makeagriculturegreatagain.com just in case or .org. Yeah. Yeah, because because coming into this with something that is common ground is a very good idea. In particular, as different people who are party to the, the the conversation are suffering from droughts or crop failures or weather or whatever. Yeah. Now the piece the piece that you just read through to us is sort of analytic. Do you want do you want the neo book, the quick first book, to feel like an analysis of what's going on and a, and a set of recommendations for what to do, or do, or is this the, the tone you want in the written work that's published? Like the thinking that you just described to us, I'm on board for. I'm not clear whether that's the method or tone that we want in the book. And you're the lead author of the book, so it's kind of up to you. So. Yeah, I, you know, this is stuff you have to let percolate for a while. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but I mean, sort of big picture, what I'm thinking is remember when we, I mean, when we first started out, we had this little play, the story of soil, mm -hmm. and how that resonated instantly. I posted it at the Sierra Club, and I instantly had two or three people who uh, wanted to make this a, a child's play for Sunday school and so on. And I, and I haven't followed up on it, actually. I mean, I'm like so underwater here. But there, there was this instant emotional response to that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So so we would have to now go into color-specific messaging. And I think the most important color, actually, I mean, the important colors are, are red, blue, and, and orange. You know? um, I mean, red because... They are so easily manipulated and and so uh, so uh, not uh, comprehending what this really is. So they're very trust focused now. Mm -hmm. uh, so they want to believe you know someone you know to telling them the right thing. And obviously that if those waters are highly polluted, um, you know, and and so to cut into something that penetrates and avoids you know the the being attacked you know, that uh would probably i mean that that would that would require some thought you know how do you how do you get there um blue i mean blue is um a call to faith uh, in in the stewardship principle of uh, our relationship with the natural world, you know that seems to be the most logical thing to 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 talk with blue. Orange is just rational, you know, cold facts and, and benefits. Orange, and orange doesn't buy climate change because there are too many moving parts and none of it. Yeah, you know, seems to make really sense, and and it's too disruptive, and you know, so so the, the they're just not convinced, uh, and uh, uh, the the climate models and so on is all, I, I mean, the, the the stunning part is that people are really uh, willing to take 40, 50 percent chances of being wrong, right? When it comes to an existential issue, so I think here the important part is. So I, I followed a debate that just totally pissed me off. I mean, it, it was one of those uh, congressional folks. Oh, it was a hearing in Congress. Mm -hmm. You had this Republican argue, well, what if you are 2% wrong 
and we do all this stuff, right? Would you be willing to take a 2% chance? And it was about terrorism or something like this. Well, what do you what do you consider the the chance you're wrong on a percentage basis? And and where's your threshold? Right? Because we're talking about the end of the world as we know it. Mm -hmm. And and so is so if you are if you are wrong, 10%, 20% is that okay? So you know you would have to engage in a in a really um in in like a, a lockdown uh, logic argument, you know, with that group. And then Queen, you just have to make sure they don't bounce off the wall and run over the cliff somewhere because they yeah. just run around with their heads cut off. Yeah. Um, two things. Have you seen Oppenheimer? Yeah. So there's that scene where, where um, oh, what's his name? The military guy basically says, you know, uh, what are the odds of us destroying the earth? And he's like, well, nearly zero. <laughs> nearly zero? What would you like? Oh, zero would be great. Um, and then separately on the on the blue layer, um, a new another new friend is a big fan of Christopher Hitchens. So I've been watching a bunch of Christopher Hitchens videos online. And oh my God, does he do a phenomenal job, unfortunately, destroying religions. Like like saying religions can do what they want. And I think I, I, it, it, one of the little clips I found was a guy from the audience saying, why do you want to take away from people this thing that seems to satisfy 95% of mankind, et cetera, et cetera. And Hitchens is like, get this straight. I'm not trying to take it away. I'm saying don't force it on me. And it doesn't make any sense. Um, but but I'm not trying to get rid of it. And it's just I, I, Hitchens is is incredibly articulate and knowledgeable about the, all the counter arguments of within the faiths, he can he can he can sort of go chapter and verse about the Bible, the Quran, and other sorts of things in ways where you're like, ah, crap. Okay, so he did his homework. Yeah, I actually did that also, but I used uh, Bill Maher instead of Hitchens as oh, as I someone, so prefer Hitchens. So <laughs> someone who debunks. It's because I don't know Hitchens. Someone oh, I'll send, you a, I'll send you a couple of links. How about that? Because Mar, right. Mar makes me a little queasy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not sure he knows his stuff, but um, mm -hmm. let me just send you a link to Christopher Hitchens in my brain, under which you will find a whole bunch of video clips. So if you follow this link, you will, and then watch just watch a couple of the, the videos that are under that thought. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll get a taste for Hitchens and his uh, devast devastating logic. I mean, he he's really economical with words. It's it, quite astonishing. And and I don't think that Hitchens approaches the way to win hearts and minds at all. I'm just really impressed with his ability to sort of take apart a part of situation and say, "Hey, look, you know, look at it this way," and to articulate a very reasonable comeback. And and. To be to be extremely aware of all of the attacks on his position, and to be able to disarm them really well, he is like uh, a, a, an Aikido black belt of rhetoric. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where and I'm bringing Aikido here because Aikido is very much about disarming the attacker. It's not about sure. brutalizing the attacker mm -hmm. like other martial arts. Yeah, yeah I was doing karate in, 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 for much of my life. Oh really? I didn't know that. And and I had friends. Actually, we had a huge Buddha club, uh, 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 club in in my hometown in Wiesbaden, like over a thousand members, and they were teaching judo, jujitsu, aikido, kendo, That's huge, and karate. And uh, we did Shotokan karate. And so I transitioned. We had you had to start in judo for six months, but I hate cool. being cut on the ground all the time. Yeah. But and and getting headaches from from falling, and then I did Aikido for a little bit, and then I ended up in karate. So I became third third German champion in middleweight karate. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's and, awesome. And yeah. then I came to the U.S. You know, I started to tinker around a little bit more, and and I, I worked in Seattle, and there was a fifty degree black belt world champion had a club up there, Shidoru. So I said, I got, I got to see this guy. So, so I went and and uh, and went back to practice, and then he wanted me to to join a tournament. So I go to this tournament. My wife watches me. <laughs> she goes, "We're done. 
you are going to stop right now. I can't just see you go to work with a black eye. This is insane. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so then I shifted into yoga instead. Yeah. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> but how long? How long ago was that? That incident? Oh well, I mean, I was like. 32, 33 years old, so now I'm 73, so a long time. Okay, 40 years ago. More than half your life ago. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. It's a great story. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm I'm still doing Aikido. I, I, I go every week like four times. Well, one of my best friends stuck with Aikido, and I kept doing karate, and then he, at one point in time, over one too many beers, confided in me that he considers karate really mentally challenged. And really smart people are going into Aikido instead. <laughs> so you're not my friend anymore. Yeah, I know they're very they're very different. It's funny. Our our dojo also does kenpo, which is a striking art, and was invented by an American uh, as a modification of a bunch of karate and other other kinds of arts. And I did a couple of kenpo classes, and kenpo is pretty much the precise opposite of aikido, where aikido would catch an arm and go with the energy and neutralize the attacker. Kenpo would block it and then like put their put their elbow through the person's nose. Yeah. And I'm like, I I, I just I didn't like <laughs> I didn't like this contrary violent energy going through mm -hmm. me at all. So I don't I don't do the kenpo classes. I just like the mm -hmm. And, and I realized that in an actual fight with anybody, I would be dust pretty quickly because anyone anyone far enough advanced of any of these martial arts who knows what they're doing can dust you in a second. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I had a violent nature. I don't know. So, so I'm proposing Aikido as a metaphoric approach to our books in the sense of blending with existing energy and then either neutralizing it or shaping it and taking it in a direction that's more productive, mm -hmm. which is all Aikido wants to do. Aikido is supposed to be a peacemaking art, and O Sensei, the founder, yeah. were, you know, wrote a book about like peacemaking. That was that was his goal, even though he'd fought in the Manchurian War and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and maybe yeah. probably as, as a result yeah. of his having think, fought in, in those wars. Yeah, I think that's a good um, mindset. You know, that's a good mindset energy to be in. Um, Klaus, one of the other thoughts that I had listening is um, how do you how do you integrate the different perspectives, um, um, you know, from the different colors? Um, how do you talk about that um, as a means of analysis, um, as a way to look at things? I mean, how do you, how do you frame it? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, you know, make the transition to put that context in of different ways of, of, of looking at it? And then, you know, how do we ultimately make decisions about um, what would be the best way to, to move forward? Those two questions. Yeah. Uh, hmm? Well, it's the, the, the technical term for this is target group marketing. A very common approach done all the time. Mm -hmm. You define a customer group. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's actually was my job. You know, working for Metro Cash and Carry in you know, with teams in thirty countries as a, a corporate head of target group marketing. Um, so we would take a customer group that had, let's say, uh, takeout pizza shops or. Um, grocery stores attached to gas stations, right? I mean, so very specifically, but you had to have enough customers of that type in a region. And then we would we would uh, uh, go in and uh, so my team of analysts, you know, would go and talk with these customers, uh, ask them if they can take, you know, an assessment of their needs. So we would take inventory, go into their walking coolers and storerooms and look at their, their uh, buying receipts and we would give them money for it or whatever, you know. But we would take a total um, um, inventory of their of, of who they are and what they do. And then we would say, so do you uh, need delivery or do you go shopping yourself and what do you prefer? So we would look at the habits that united these groups, right? And then we would develop a summary. Uh, and uh, first of all, we develop training materials with over 6,000 salespeople in the field. So we would develop very narrow market specific uh, approaches because even in Germany, Berlin is different than Hamburg. You know, I mean, Berlin had a huge influx of Turkish 
uh, populations, and that was not the case in Hamburg. So, so you would go, you would go to to uh, 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 sort of local and regional representations and train your sales force. This is who these people are. This is how you find them. This is how you talk to them. And then we would talk with operations saying, okay, there are some service requirements you need to adapt to, let's say the uh, payment structures or way to order and so on. And then we would talk to procurement and say, okay, you need to change your pack sizes here, or we need to introduce a couple of items that are not on the shelf right now. So, on. so that's target market specific action. And so I see this very similar here. You develop a group that is, that is profiled sufficiently narrow, but not so narrow that you that you miss it, right? I mean, so it's sufficiently narrow uh, in 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 ways that categorizes fairly accurately, you know, how these folks think. So when you take, for example, um, uh, uh, Christian, uh, 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 let's say self-professed, you know, religious people, it doesn't have to just be Christian, it can be Muslims, whatever. So they they are living in a certain uh, world of uh, uh, they're looking at the world through very specific classes, right? So they you know their vision is quite aligned in how they interpret the world around them, you know. And then when you and so you you do that for each color, and there are really gen generalities. And this is the power of uh, spiral dynamics, right? Because it frames the most common personality traits that you see in these groupings. Also uh, understanding that people are oftentimes in, in multiple colors and that different colors light up depending on stress factors and, and, and external influence factors. But most commonly, you know, this, this Christian person lives in this reality. So then, uh, and, and I see this constantly, particularly when politicians want to talk and so on, they fail to connect you know, with the with the reality perception of their audience. Yeah, they're not they're not um, they're not really communicating because they have no audience um, centricity about what they're what they're conveying. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just I just want to say that Jimmy Carter in particular, but Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, all three of them could quote chapter and verse of the Bible, taught Sunday school, were very sturdy, um, rep e even if Clinton in particular didn't live his life that way very much, but but they they really tried to address, and it was, and it was Jimmy Carter who opened the door for evangelicals to embrace Nixon afterward, or sorry, uh, he, Nixon was before, but to, to sort of, to go toward Reagan, um, like 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 Jimmy Carter opened the door for religious people to 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 sort of connect politics and religion more than they had before. It's weird, but but but, but Carter like like was a totally credible religious person, completely yeah. credible, and, and and I don't understand how that never worked in the favor of fixing the world somehow. Yeah, one of the other things that I'm that I'm thinking is. Um, this approach could be used um, for whatever subject matter we happen to be talking about to reach different audiences. And I think that's the that's that's Klaus's goal in writing this section exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be about farming. It could be about you know so many different um, critical pieces. Yeah. And Klaus, in the spirit of neo books, as you write or edit the GPT generated texts uh, around the section on spiral dynamics, you might want to think about what Stuart just said in the in the sense of there might be an explanatory nugget right in the middle that says here's how the system works and here's what's going on that could be reused in other contexts than yeah. uh, this particular book's thesis about soil water. Uh, in agriculture, right? And and then after, when you start implementing, then all the Im implementation will be specific to this domain uh, because it kind of has to be give, given what this book is about. But that there could be like a, a middle nugget or two that are very reusable as clean explanations of why this framework is useful in contexts like this. Yeah, it's, it's part of it. It becomes part of our um, editorial um, policy. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I could put something right here before I go into food. 
Right. You said where that would fit. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and just hey, what is this spiral dynamics thing, and why is it useful? Uh, just just a paragraph or two like that would be great right here, and then those would be reusable. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I don't know exactly what the relationship is. I know they're associated close between spiral dynamics and Otto Scharmer and theory U, um, but I don't know if anybody saw the free. Um, theory you course that Otto Scharmer is offering that I posted in um, the OGM um, listserv this morning. Mm -hmm. So I've I've uh, been with Otto Scharmer's course there since when it first came out, uh, 2016, 17, something like this, when they started, and I've taken it twice. Cool. And then I became a member of the Presencing Institute that he has set up. Right. And I connected the Palouse region there uh, with um, the Otto Schwisty presencing workshop. You know, I actually did a one minute TikTok <laughs> to, for them to help them apply for it. No, I, I'm fascinated by, by the Otto Schama the theory of uh, social change and it completely fits in. And in my, in, in Otto Schama will be the first one to agree here. It needs to be combined with spiral dynamics because, um, the whole the whole point of of theory U is to take you know a a uh, uh, a problem let's say or a deep seated uh, issue and and um, run it through the iceberg model as a first step to explore its connectedness and its its interrelations and dependencies and then from there dig deeper and deeper through social. Uh, uh, interplays right to to align uh, people's understanding of what this really is down to a, an area where of called presencing. So at the bottom of the U, you know, is presencing. That means we are all now understanding uh, the same issue. You now we we know we 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 know and accept you know what we're dealing with. And then you move up from there into crystallizing, crystallizing meaning, you know, where do we need to go? And then you go into prototyping, you know, and 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 action actual actualizing. So no, it's a fascinating, particularly for me, having been in project management so much of my life, um, I thought it was, it was just a, a, an amazing way to to look at project management. I love that. I'm looking through my brain and I found a place where um spiral dynamics and theory you might overlap a bunch which is the four fields of conversation talking nice talking tough reflective dialogue and generative type dialogue because it feels like it kind of moves up the up the spiral somewhat and there may be other places but i wonder if there's anybody out there who has sort of more formally done the comparison or even tried to implement something that combines the two theories so they don't call it spiral dynamics, but they call it, uh, they have this social theater kind of thing um, where- um, Social presencing theater. Yeah, social, but that's where that happens, right? Because in the social presencing theater, you accept that um, that people come from different places. You know, they live, uh, they, you know, they, they are perceiving differently. Uh -huh. And then, so to move everyone to the same to the same uh, understanding um me uh, is being done through this social presencing theater which involves uh, dancing and and meditation hmm. um, you know so so yeah that's so so that's how this is incorporated cool super interesting thank you i'd totally forgotten that i've ever put social presencing theater in my brain which i did in 2013 apparently mm -hmm. <laughs> i well, mean it's just connecting the dots, really. Right? It's all out there. Yep. The truth is out there. Oh, wait, that comes from the wrong TV show. Yeah. So just uh, to bring you up to date on where our conversation has taken me in, in my thinking, um, when I sat down to start to do a little bit more writing about the... Um, a little fable or fantasy or a piece of science fiction for the future. The first thing that popped up was, oh, okay, 
So as people implement some of the ideas I suggest and using my models for agreement, what's the agreement that all of these people that come together, <laughs> what do they come up with? <laughs> and that's 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 the next piece of writing um, that I will do, a piece of fantasy about how they come together and, and how they reach some form of consensus agreement about moving the world forward in a different way. Mm -hmm. Sounds cool. Yeah. And that'll be fun. That'll be, that'll, that will actually be fun to do. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 uh, COEU school, um, would argue that um, the starting point is to align intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, so so you come from this problem, you move down into iceberg model, then you move into the social presencing to combine people coming from different walks of life, different education, different beliefs, and so on. But they all are joined by a common intention. Yeah, and 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 the common intention here, beautiful and. I would ar articulate that in um, in the following way. Um, when you take any problem, if you chunk up big enough, you can usually come to a shared intention. So the shared intention here is, you know, how do how do we how do we not let the species go over a cliff on its current trajectory? And the intention is we're here to fix this. We're here to see what we can do as a as as an intelligent group subgroup of the species to prevent us from going over the cliff. But yeah, an important an important piece to articulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had Jerry. I would say even with saying OGM, we're not necessarily aligned around climate change. What is it? How does it work? What are the key influence factors? And how would you pull the most the biggest lever that's out there? And what is it? Well, that's why I was sort of bringing in my conversations with this fellow Scott and his his sort of opinions on it. And then that caused me to go out and look at a bunch of things to try to understand Amory Lovin's objections to nuclear and a bunch of other things. And and none of this is posted any place, especially clearly. Um, and and I have one little excerpt that I that I put in my brain uh, that. Uh, it's from a private mailing list that I'm on that Amory Lovins and Carl Page are both on. <clears throat> and Carl Page is Larry Page's brother. Uh, Larry Page is the co-founder of Google. I've met Carl mm -hmm. Page before a couple of times. He's like really, really interested in a bunch of stuff uh, very earnestly, but he's also a proponent for nuclear now. Um, and also what Scott recommended was to watch uh, the documentary Nuclear Now by, uh, what's his name? The guy who did, Oliver Stone. Uh, apparently all, Nuclear Now is really good. Uh, and another another big proponent of nuclear as a pragmatic solution for right now is Stuart Brand. So there's a bunch of <clears throat> people out there who are saying, no, 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 we need to we need to do nukes. We can do small, fast, controllable, non-dangerous nukes. Here's the technology. Let's let, let let's go do a lot of that because because because. Um, but there's no, and this is the stumper. There's no place where these things are easily and clearly described where they are annotatable by, by people who object or want to clarify or want to discuss, where they are clearly explained in simple models by science popularizers or other people, et cetera. I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in that thing. Where do we put things? Right now, so, where we put things is uh, the, you know, the internet and YouTube videos. So, so, so let me go back a second, because Jerry, what you're pointing to to me is... Um, is, is the example of Einstein's mantra that the thinking that's got us here is not going to get us to a solution. And, and the thinking of most people is, is one of advocacy and being right. And people not realizing that they may have a little piece of the solution, but they don't have the whole solution. And in conversation with others, they're not really, op not really, really open to influence. Mm -hmm. by, by what they hear because yes. they're advocating for their position and 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 it really um this was in the zen the zen calendar mantra for yesterday said huh. it's, it's a it's a yeah um good good one that works oscar wilde i knew nothing but shadows 
and I thought them to be real. I knew nothing but shadows, and I thought them to be real. My interpretation of that for purpose of this discussion is that um, we see through our own filters, and sometimes we're totally blind to, 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 to a different reality of what could be present in a, in a, in a, in a certain situation. Okay, but we see the world through our own filters. I'm also informed by the brilliance of, um, in her work with conflict resolution, Angelus Arian. Mm, I love her. Fourfold way. I always use this in teaching, fourfold way. And I'll translate in a minute, my translation. Show up, pay attention, tell your truth. Don't be attached to outcome. Show up is be present to have a real conversation. Pay attention is really listen to what's being said, okay? Show up, pay attention, tell your truth, but recognize that there are multiple truths. And don't be attached to outcome means don't be an advocate, but be open to influence by what you hear. Wow, mm -hmm. that's a really interesting point. I never thought about that. Um, hmm. I need to rethink my entire thesis based upon what you just said mm -hmm. um, so that we can, in collaboration, come up with a solution that might be even better than any one person said. So this notion of no nukes versus nukes, well, it's black and white thinking. You know, there might be situations where nukes are the best thing. Um, just, I, I throw that out as, as an example, uh, from, from what we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Stuart, thank you for reminding me about her. I, I love Angela Sarian, by the way, and, uh, have the fourfold way, but haven't really fully read it, but did annotate the fourfold way in brief here, uh, which I should probably rephrase as the four principles of the fourfold way, uh, which I'll do right now. But it's a to me it's a brilliant mantra for being in in real dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, and and the, what the thing I wanted to add also to what you're saying is that um, the listening thing is far more important than most people realize because most people stay in advocacy because they haven't unloaded the advocacy from their brain, and until and unless they get that out of their head and know that the other person has heard it, they're going to stay on that horse. And they, yes. they, they will be hard to dissuade, to dismount and, and relax and do something else. Now, once they feel like they've been sort of heard and absorbed, and if, they're, if good questions come back or if there's engagement, then they're engaged. And we don't realize this a lot. So instead, um, a long time ago, I coined the term duologue, which is a two concurrent monologues. Beautiful. Um but but also, and I I I thought you were going to go here, but what you just said also speaks to the idea of um, even one person um, stepping off of their advocacy role, meaning they're just throwing out the information that they know and that they understand, but mm -hmm. their mindset isn't one of advocacy. Their mindset is one of wisdom thinking to generate to generate levels of wise thinking wise outcomes not my outcome mm -hmm. um Klaus, back to what you're saying a moment ago about red blue orange being the most salient layers of spiral dynamics for this book and for this activity which i sounds like right to me um so maybe what the book does is it says here are the the all the different layers and how they work and we're just going to like play out three of them, which seem like the most important ones, and then go deeper into those three colors, uh, those three layers, and and play out some kind of a strategy or approach, or even, or even have a vignette or a short story or a or an eight hundred word blog post length thing that goes fully in that direction in that mode of speaking with that with that approach that would make that would be really interesting because it would it would exemplify uh what you're talking about really nicely and it would then make you know put it in the book 
And you don't need then to do all layers. And I think doing all layers would be too much. It would also distract from the important ones. So I really like the idea of just doing the three in more depth. Yeah. Um, Does that work for you? Yeah, hold on. I think that's, uh, let me just. Uh, um, so what we what we were saying is, uh, so I will lay in here um, probably an extract from from the uh, summary of, of uh, spiral dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, what is it? How does it work? And then um, coming to the end of it, so so this is hold on. I was we can take this out. Um, and uh, say it's 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 done. Mm -hmm. um, and then we could continue here. Mm -hmm. um, Talking in color. Yeah, the uh, uh, but narrowing it down to just the three layers, right? Yeah. So I would. I'm just for for, for just for myself of the uh, sure. sure. Yep. So talking in color, and then I then I would uh, I would start out by saying idiosyncrasies. I guess that's what I meant to say. Yes. <laughs> um, and. Uh, <clears throat> World view, um, these are still explanations of red. Um, and what I'm what I'm suggesting here is play this out as the story of red. Like tell the story. Don't, if you're going to explain, uh, and I, I think you probably need some explanation. But but what I'm saying is, run through the scenario that the book presents through the lens of spiral dynamics for each of these colors. Like, tell me what that story actually is. Propose one. So question, okay? Yes. And um, and I missed um, many a meeting, and you guys may have talked about this and maybe not, all right? As a matter of editorial policy, okay, what is the purpose of a neo book? Is it to move people to action? Is it to inform? Um, in a broad it, way, what could be? It could be uh, so a neo book could be any kind of book. It could be a persuasive book. It could be drama. It could be a play. It could be anything. Okay. okay. The, the 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 conceits behind the neo book are several. One is that books are these sort of static souvenirs. Books are kind of inert and they're, they're snapshots of a lively community at a point in time. And what's really interesting is the lively community and all the information contained in the book loosened into the world and made useful for people who want to act on what the book is about. And books don't do any of that. Books are basically little prisons for words is, is yeah. kind of the conceit. Mm -hmm. And also that many things that are written very well in books could be reused in other books that don't have the same ending or that are about a different topic. So when, you know, the spiral dynamics module in, in the, the book that Klaus is writing is a really perfect example because I can easily imagine a book that has the same first four chapters, and then instead of spiral dynamics, is all, it posits or uses a different framework for, and here's how we might approach doing this. And those would be parallel uh, volumes in a series that says, hey, this series about, is about fixing the earth, except we're going to put a, a, a series of different lenses on what to do about it. And you could see that, and that would be like a really nice use of, of neo books as a collection. And then... Uh, then the module explaining spiral dynamics could be used in a different series or in a different book about some other topic entirely, not about fixing the world, but about interpersonal relationships or team dynamics or whatever. And, and, and so this, re, this composability is like the second great virtue, I think, of neobooks, is that if you author for composability, 
then you wind up having a series of linked nuggets that make up a lot of different books and a lot of different ideas. And by the way, you may not have to read every chapter of every book you run into because a lot of them are going to start sharing some chapters. And you'll be like, yep, I don't have to read chapter four. I already read that. It was in the last book. And that should not be a terrible thing. That should be a great thing. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of where we're going. And 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 to me, books are souvenirs. They're just yeah. they're just snapshots in time. I yeah. am I am sort of over the book. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So I changed the, the title a, a little bit here. Mm -hmm. It sounds you'll find the right title once you sort of generate the thing. But but Klaus, does it make sense what I was saying? I I just want you to ask ChatGPT to generate an 800 word essay in the framing of red, uh, answering the question about all the generative ag stuff that's in the book, you know, in in the outline so far. So if you can sort of as much as you can cue it with um, uh, the framing of the book. Uh, what what is the actual essay that you post or publish to people who think in red? And that goes there. And then same exact topic, except now you're talking to blue and just do exactly the same exercise. And then same for orange. And I think that the difference between the three, I have a funny feeling is going to be really, really interesting. And Stuart, if this doesn't sound good to you, also like leap in, but... I'm just saying that the more operational, the more hands-on the book appears, especially late in the book, which is where we are, I think the better. And then you're not being proscriptive, but you're being descriptive, if I use those words right. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe this direction here. Yeah. And and not just about our connection with the biosphere, but about what actions to take, what to do and why. And, and what to do and why is important because the why, GPT will be clever enough to connect the why to the color. And the why is going to change dramatically given the color that we're in. It'll be interesting to see how that comes up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm willing to bet that the answers, your 800 word essays are substantially different. Because I can imagine that you would open with a different thing for each color. Your, your opening salvo, the, the thing you say to get interest, would be different if you yeah. were talking to someone in red, blue, or orange. Very different. Yeah, I mean, I actually um, had to uh, modify um, the... Uh, where are we? Are you looking for Zoom? Are you looking okay. for ChatGPT? Good. Um, I actually had to modify this question several times, you know, the, uh, yes, yes. Um, so here's the question I asked. Uh, yep. So you might want to copy much of this question, except now ask for advice of, around that question. What is the answer for a red audience? Yeah. For a, you know, spiral dynamics, red audience. Yeah. yeah that yeah. should, that should yield something pretty interesting. So when you get back the um, results from chat GPT, what do you do with them? Oh, I, I edit it. I have to edit it. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and and, and, and I, the, so the way this book is going, I think chat GPT will get credit as an, as a co-author. I mean, I think that like, like Reed Hoffman just published a book where chat GPT is his co-author on purpose. He did it really fast. That's great. And, and I think that's totally fine and clear because then it's like, yep, we 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 asked questions of the of the of the global intelligence. It answered back. We edited those results along with our words, and here it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as we all know, you know, at least to me, one of the most difficult pieces of writing something uh, is getting that first draft out. And if 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 Chat GPT can do a credible job with it, there you go. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty standard approach now, Stuart. I mean, uh, the students are using it. Yeah. Uh, even lawyers are using it, you know, yeah. to, to take out the first draft. And then yeah. you then you realize you missed out on the question or you put the comma in the wrong place. And you know, so then you redo that and then you still have to edit it. So, uh, yeah. 
Of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're getting you're getting to like 70%, 60-70% of what you're trying to say. You know, it's amazing. I don't know if I told you guys this last week or before, but uh, a guy named Sammy and I, he's a Finn who lives in Melbourne. He and I are trying to stand up a community for ethical cyborgs. And we asked, he he did most of the, the prompt engineering. Uh, he asked ChatGPT to come up with what is what should we name this community and what should the tagline be? Uh, and then to riff on that in a couple different ways. And we have a hundred choices that are really interesting 50 of which are things I would never have imagined sort of putting in the mix. And so our our, our creative space uh, for thinking through what, what to call this community is much larger than we could have made it, which I really, really appreciate. I mean, it's a tool, you know. I was, when, 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 uh, when PCs came out, I was a hotel GM at the time, actually working for Harsh Investment. I worked for Harsh Schnitzer. And- Oh, wow. Yeah, I left. I've had a crazy life, <laughs> but I was uh, bored. And I mean, I, I was managing this hotel, and I got bored, and so I bought myself an Apple two plus sixty four K memory, um, and I put I put uh, Lotus one two three on it, and I loaded up the entire hotel budget, and my boss came in uh, in the afternoon and made all kinds of changes. You know, you have the, these big sheets there, right, and it. I mean, it would have taken you hours you know, to recalculate this thing. Then we went out for dinner. Well, I went up and inserted the changes and we printed it. And for breakfast, I gave him a new printout. He just about fell off his chair, you know. And that immediately got me promoted to be the tech guru for Harsh Investment. Of course. <laughs> and so then I started working at the Claremont Resort in Berkeley. And I mean, I got no way. So here's, here's Schnitzer of Schnitzer Properties, which was Harsh Investments. Um, so I'm going to say harsh alumni, which is what I do, uh -huh. and I'm going to attach you to it. Oh, I don't say, oh, you're attaching me to it. <laughs> I mean, I was, you're yeah. a harsh alumni and I'm going to connect this to alumni, which is alumni. Watch this of everything. Yeah. I mean, he let me, I, I could buy anything I wanted, you know, in computer. He actually put. PCs on everybody's desk wow. I was so enamored with this uh, uh, playing what if games, you know, that allowed you to, the, the spread sheets allowed you to do. And Stuart, what, year is it, what year is this class? Okay, so that was uh, 1981, something like this, uh, 82, yeah. I've been digging through, I'm melting boxes of my, of my archives and all that, and I've been running into things from that vintage. And it's super, super interesting. And I'm getting old enough that I'm I'm finding dot matrix printed print out letters that I sent. Yeah. Right. And it's like, ah, oh, I know exactly when. I know exactly where that was and what that device was. And oh my God, I remember. I was, I, I was working at AT and T from eighty one to eighty six. Didn't know that in the marketing department. There you okay. go. <laughs> when when PCs first started to pop up in uh, you know on 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 desktops wow the thing that pops to mind was you know when i left when i decided to leave so i bought an at&t computer um you know i don't know 30 40 percent employee discount um computer printer and when it arrives <laughs> the warranty is 30 days <laughs> ah! <laughs> wow <laughs> That's brutal. Wow. <laughs> and I said, that's brutal. That's yeah. terrible. That's that's just awful. <laughs> 30 days. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, well, mm -hmm. memories. Yeah, exactly. I know. It's very funny. Well, we all go back that far. Woohoo. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the first bi directional dot matrix printer. I was sitting in front of this thing for half an hour. <laughs> just like, yeah. Oh, man. Um, I still have my Mac Classic upstairs. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah, the, I have one of the one of the classics that has all the names of the the original team written. Their yeah. signatures are inside the case. Yeah, um, I just have no idea who wants it, or you know, uh, I don't think it's valuable. But, but I don't but want to just dump it. Yeah, what an extraordinary experience I had. I mean, it was when corporations were still doing huge amounts of training. I had the equivalent of of an MBA, a grounding in technology. And then, and then sales training, um, 
state-of-the-art sales training. The last exercise was a three-week in-residence sales school in Denver, I remember. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't pass the sales case, you were out of a job. You got fired. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And people did get fired. I mean, it was just... You know, they had actors playing senior executives in organizations and you had to make the make the sale as part of a sales team. Yeah, that that sounds pretty brutal. Yeah, it was. (laughs) Get your attention. (laughs) I I went to Wharton and I did the management simulation game and my team won that year. And I found the paper we turned in, uh, which I printed on my dot matrix pinner. So. Okay. So, all right, you went to you went to Wharton that year. So, do you remember right across from City Hall, the Clothespin Building in Philadelphia? I think so. Yeah, big big artifact. Big artifact. Every every new building had to have a, a an external piece of art. A big piece of art. That's yeah, where, that's where I worked for AT and T. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. The Clothespin Building was uh, the Clothespin was an Oldenburg statue, Oldenburg sculpture. Class, could have been. Been. Could have could have could have been. But it was uh, it was right opposite city. It was right opposite city halls, like fifteenth and fifteenth and Market in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Oh God, who created the Philly Club Soldenberg? That's him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. Ah, the good old days, and and, <laughs> and we have so much tech now. It's crazy, and we still can't solve these problems. Jeez. Yeah, it's just making stuff more complicated than it needs to be. You know? Yeah, yeah. And like Levi Strauss, uh, the suppliers are making lots of money along the way. Um, cool. What do we want to queue up for next week? Um, I think we're we're making really nice progress. Um, and Stuart, let us know when you sort of had a rethink and want to regenerate or re-edit or re-whatever your uh, manuscript, because... Um, uh, you know, uh, the goal is to do this multiple times in different ways and to figure out how to make a r- regular routine of making neo books. And if you're interested, I know you have links to some known publishers yourself. Uh, uh, no, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, cool. and, and Klaus, I don't know if you know, but Stuart is part of the reason April is with uh, uh, Baird Kaler. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the fun connections. Yeah. yeah. April is on the Camino right now. Uh, she is one week in uh, on a three week trip. Uh, yesterday's hike was really, really hard and it poured rain. You know, I, I saw her, her newsletter reporting that. Yeah. Um, and I, I got momentarily jealous of, uh, of that, that, that trek. Um, she's carrying, she's carrying a pretty heavy pack because she has. Is she? Computer and all her valuable electronics are on her back. Wow, her back, her back's pretty heavy. Pretty heavy, yeah. yeah. Um, and she's got luggage that there's a group that moves her her one bag forward to the next place the next day. So she's not carrying everything, but still her backpack is too heavy. Yeah. So I did a few years ago. A it was a, a it was a quote quote El Camino like experience. A a, a little a pilgrimage that David White, the poet, did. Oh, sweet. Um, through um, um, Tuscany, oh. um, but he equated part of it, and he's got a bunch of poems about you know his, his experience with El Camino. Oh, fabulous! Um, yeah, mm-hmm. cool. yeah. As a matter of fact, w- one of the the things that I remember from one of his poems is that when you finish whatever that means, you're supposed to leave something behind. Mm. And I think it was his. Um, his niece who who chose he left leave, his niece behind he no to leave his niece chose to leave her shoes behind when, oh. she, when she had been done with the with the trek yep yeah uh, he, he writes about that that's cool you also get a certificate and uh, you get that at the beginning and then they put stamps in your in your passport basically along the way you get a seashell because that's one of the icons of the camino it's an interesting thing um see you all next week and in in between another calls yeah it is if it means anything it is it is labor day next monday that's right mm-hmm. my god mm-hmm. crazy mm-hmm.
That's where he started. I, I can't debate, I can't debate <laughs> so that's, so, so that's work. Right? I know. That, that's, so where that's, where he, that's where he started the call. It was like, ah, it looks like fall is coming. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Yeah. Bye-bye.